Good evening. I extend a warm welcome to you all in the Great Hall this evening. For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Hayley Eber. I'm the Acting Dean of the Erwin S. Channon School of Architecture here at the Cooper Union. As part of our enduring partnership with the Architecture League, I'm thrilled to commence tonight's program, a deep dive into the project study of the American Museum of Natural History's Richard Gilder Center for Science Education and Innovation. This evening's proceedings will encompass insightful presentations from both representatives of the museum and the brilliant minds behind its design, with the invaluable involvement of Studio Gang and AM&H leadership. So without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce our moderator, Julie Yovine, who in turn will present our speakers, Lisa Guggenheim, Director of the American Museum of Natural History, and Weston Walker, Principal and Partner in Charge of Studio Gang's New York office. Julie Yovine's journey is a fascinating one. After several decades as a design and architecture journalist, including stints at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington and the sorry the Wall Street Journal and the Architects newspaper she embarked on a new path in 2017 she pursued a degree in animal behavior and conservation at Hunter College while researching elephant communication in Africa may have been a distant dream her passion for applied animal animal behavior led her to become involved in private dog training with pets for vets a nonprofit organization dedicated to matching rescue dogs with veterans who have PTSD. Additionally, Julie serves on the board of the Animals and Society Institute, a think tank and research forum committed to advancing the science that fosters well-being of the animals that we share this planet with. So I don't think we could have scripted this better. Julie's unique blend of architectural criticism and her profound understanding of the natural world make her the ideal moderator for this evening's discussion. Before we delve into our program, I would like to express gratitude to the sponsors who have made this evening's event possible. This program receives support from public funds provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council of the Arts, with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislator. We also extend our heartfelt appreciation to the dedicated members of the Architecture League of New York whose ongoing support sustains the League's programs and various initiatives. So with that, I would like to invite Julie Ovin to the podium to introduce tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you, Haley, uh, and thank you, Cooper Union, for hosting us all tonight. And welcome all to tonight's I also use deep diving, so we're going to really be revealing something. Deep diving exploration into the visioning process, construction, and above all, the collaboration between client and architect in realizing the Richard Gilder Center for Science, Education, and Innovation. We'll all be guided by the two people, Lisa Guggenheim and Wes Walker, who know really better than anyone else the ins and outs the trials, the trails, the negotiations, and the public engagement that culminated in the Gilder Center, a standout achievement and distinctive presence adding to the luster of the museum itself, the Upper West Side, and the city of New York. The Gilder Center is, was no small undertaking, connecting 10 of 24 built building elements accrued over about 150 years via 33 connecting points with minimal impact on the, the surrounding park. The design was unveiled, I think, in, uh, initially in 2015 and opened this past May. The Architectural League has long wanted to present such a program where both client and architect share, hopefully not too unvarnished, the story of the path they forged together to arrive at the new building. As someone who spent a career writing about architecture, then decamped to the natural world of animal behavior and conservation, because to my mind, it's all about nonverbal interspecies, maybe even interspatial communication. I'm especially interested in hearing about what this new addition to an almost 150 year old institution wants to tell us about itself 
and about our culture now. So the program will be, uh, first Lisa will be speaking and then Wes will come to the podium with a slide presentation. We'll follow that with a conversation for about uh, 30 minutes and there should be time for about 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. So let me first, uh, happy to, and very uh, impressed to introduce Lisa Guggenheim, who's the director of AMNH since 2021, but has been steeped in the strategic and institutional planning, educational coordination, and overall outreach for over two, week, two, two decades before that. Lisa helped guide the museum through the unprecedented challenges presented by the pandemic, which hit just as the planning and execution of the Gilder was getting, hitting its stride. She has found new ways to develop public-private partnerships and expanded the role of nonprofit institutions in supporting community and growing a better society for all. She was responsible for launching Urban Advantage, a nationally recognized multi-institutional partnership that engages some 90,000 New York City elementary and middle school students and their teachers every year since it was founded almost 20 years ago. She was a key player in developing the museum's Richard Gilder Graduate School with its Masters of Arts in Teaching Earth Science. Roughly half of all of New York City's earth science teachers have benefited from that program. Determined to make the museum a welcoming environment to a broad and diverse audiences, Lisa initiated and co-leads a reassessment of how the museum presents non-Western cultures, the fruits of which I believe can already be seen throughout the Gilder's new and reframed exhibitions that were developed by Ralph Applebaum and Associates. Lisa, thank you for being here. We're, I hope you're ready to spill the beans. Um, our other panelist, Wes Walker, is the design principal and partner in charge of Studio Gang's New York office. He, Wes has been at Studio Gang for over 15 years, designing cultural and educational institutions, complex civic buildings and towers across the Americas. He has led Studio Gang in New York as it, com uh, um, as it completed new training facilities for the FDNY's Rescue Company Number no. 2 in Brooklyn, the award-winning Solar Carve Tower in the Meatpacking District, and a neighborhood activation study focused on promoting public safety through community design and local problem solving. Farther afield, he led the design on the Enterprise Research Campus at Harvard and Block F, the central building in the upcoming Mission Rock development in San, in San Francisco. West studied architecture at Yale University, where he was awarded the AIA Henry Adams Medal for Academic Excellence and received his BA in music from Cornell University, graduating summa cum laude for his thesis work exploring systems of perception and meaning in both musical and architectural spaces. He could probably throw in animals too. Anyway, welcome Wes. We're all ears to what you have to say. And first, we'll have Lisa come to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was lovely and much appreciated. I look forward to the conversation, Wes. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, talk tonight, and thank you for the invitation. It's very exciting um, to be here, to reflect a bit on the building now, a few months since opening May 4th. Um, I want to talk a bit about the museum to start, and then we'll dive into the project. Um, so the museum chartered um, as mentioned in 1869, um, whose purpose um, was to advance scientific research and education, at the time called popular instruction. Um, while the core of our mission has really persisted all this time, um, of course, we believe we've evolved, if you will, to meet society's changing needs. Be that presenting foundational information about overarching topics like climate change and biodiversity loss, or generally explaining developments in the scientific field. So when our strategic planning process identified the need for a new addition, we also recognized that any new space would need to first animate the scientific principles of the 21st century, especially to invoke the understanding that all life is connected, provide new avenues for visitors 
um, to connect with the outputs of modern science, including current research, into the most diverse groups of animals on Earth, insects, and the hidden realms of our universe as revealed by data. Supply additional facilities for the museum's educational programs, which have grown dramatically, as mentioned. And um, importantly, we learned from the Rose Center um, for Earth and Space that some of you may be familiar with on 81st Street, designed by Paul Schuck Partners, which opened in 2000. And we learned just how critically important and the opportunity for architecture to reinforce our mission. And we aspired for the same thing in Gilder. I'll leave it to others to decide how we achieved that or how well we achieved it. But I'd like now to you know, turn to the Gilder Center itself, but first just give a, a few more remarks about the museum because I think the, the impact of the Gilder Center is understood in that context. Each year, uh, the museum welcomes millions of visitors to its more than 40 galleries, which feature iconic exhibits like the life-size blue whale, the Tyrannosaurus rex, habitat dioramas, and of course, an exploration of planetaria, space science, and earth science. We also have secret, uh, I'm sorry, we also have special exhibits and upcoming is the secret world of elephants, um, um, unrelated to tonight's moderator's interests, but, but we hope supported by her. Um, and that opens November 8th. Um, the museum's scientific enterprise, which notwithstanding many years of effort, many people don't understand or don't know that we have approximately 175 scientists working at the museum um, every day. Um, in disciplines ranging from astrophysics to zoology, and a scientific collection of more than 34 million specimens and artifacts. The museum is unique in the educational life of the city, and that was mentioned, and we can talk about that some more. Um, but I think what then becomes clear is that the need for the Gilder Center really rested on science being the core of not only the most pressing needs in society, but critically in the area of the public understanding of science in order for people to have the ability to live their lives, to exercise the franchise, to support their families, to support their careers, and to support other civic activities. So at the same time as we understand the presence and the prevalence of science in, in people's lives, we also understand that there's a critical, critical crisis in science education. Um, um, referred to as STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, now with an added M of medicine often, so double M's at the end. Um, this, this crisis really exists both among students and families at all ages, um, as well as in the ranks of teachers. And um, science curriculum in, in the US thankfully really focuses on learning science by doing science. But that is a practice that is very remote in New York City and very remote nationally. Um, and so many, many schools are ill-equipped to provide that kind of science instruction. And so we have worked over the last two decades, um, as described, really working at the intersection of policy curriculum program. And um, what we discovered in the context of our attendance growing exponentially from 3 million to 5 million, and the numbers of hundreds of thousands of school children coming to the museum, that we really came to understand that our educational mission needed um, reconceptualization. So we founded a graduate school, so the museum confers both a PhD and a Master of Arts in Teaching. and. Um, we also realized importantly that Wes will talk about our educational facilities themselves were wildly outdated and needed addressing and you'll see soon how that was accomplished. So I'm going to turn now to a little bit about the architectural history. Um, but before doing that, I just want to talk about, uh, for those people that have been in the museum, the challenge of circulation at the museum. Given this campus and the t numbers of buildings that we had, um, there was not a natural flow for visitors on each floor, and that was a major finding that we came to when we began to consider the new building that you're here tonight to learn about. So the architectural history of the museum is characterized, as you see, by a series of changing approaches to the original master plan, which was developed by Calvert Vox and Jacob Ray Mould 
1872, and you see that here in yellow, the yellow dot is the new building. It is not, however, a yellow dot. Um, but um, we, they also designed building one, um, the first building of the museum. And at the time that it opened, the city was in its infancy. The master plan followed by Katie Bergen C. Um, and what you can see here is that master plan outlined in a four square, what we would call now a super block. Um, and it was imagined, as you can see, as a single for, you know, visitor loop. Um, and we'll talk more about how, how we did or did not accomplish that over 150 years. But I think um, it's well understood that, that when this was conceived, the Upper West Side was in its infancy, right? So it's a beautiful image. Um, and I think everyone's familiar with the bounds here of Central Park West, Columbus, 81st Street, and Central Park West. So in the preceding years, um, to the Gilder Center, we had renovated three of the facades of the museum, um, including the Rose Center, renovation of the Central Park West facade, and also um, the 77th Street facade. And so for the Gilder Center, we issued an RFP in 2010. Um, it was revised again in 2013, and we solicited proposals for a new building at Columbus Avenue and 79th Street. The project would complete this east-west axis that you can see here that was envisioned and create a north-south connection as well, and we'll learn more about that. So after reviewing proposals, no secret here that the museum selected Studio Gang uh, to design the Gilder Center, in part because the firm really discovered the heart of the campus as this master plan had envisioned. Um, they embraced the legacy that we had in science and education, but understood how we wanted to take that work forward. And in developing the concept, they saw an opportunity to reclaim this heart, this astronomical tower, that of course is not an astronomical tower, but was conceived to be the center of this campus. Um, and as we've discussed, that was accomplished through many, many connections and deep work to move this building as eastward as we could and to sustain the relationship, as you see, between the museum and its park. Um, we are a museum in a park. And obviously, the Gilder Center also found inspiration in the processes of nature themselves and was meant to improve and enhance our visitor experience. So now, for fun, um, we'll just share that this is the Central Park West entrance. This is the Great Ocean Life Hall. Um, this is the Gilder Center, almost with your back to Columbus Avenue facing east. And this is what it was about for us, right? Which is having visitors enjoy the space and wonder and be inspired. And I think with that is a perhaps perfect pivot to Wes. Yes, I hope. All right, thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you to everybody for coming tonight. Really excited to, um, to also, I'll say it, dive deep um, on the design, which I could talk about forever, so I'll try to um, you know, behave. Um, but I, I'll, I'll just um, add on to what Lisa was saying about um, our excitement about discovering the history of this campus. This image is amazing. This is building one. Um, this is a Victorian Gothic building sitting kind of next to this puddle before Central Park, before anything else was around it, um, the first building of the museum um, from 1877. Um, so Lisa showed these images, but um, just to comment a little bit more deeply on physically what this master plan means to us, we see in the four square plan, um, four courtyards, <clears throat> this is pre-air conditioning. Um, there's, a, there's a response to access to light and fresh air in the, in the proportion of the buildings, and, um, and there's a response to the um, flow of visitors and users of the building throughout in the continuity of everything. There's no dead ends here. <clears throat> um, so now we move into what actually happened, um, and this is an image from, I believe, the late 30s that starts to show um, the changing nature of the campus in response to different functional needs and the changing, changing of science and the changing of the urban context that are, that are kind of pushing back on the purity of the master plan. So we can see um, what is referred to here. Can you see my pointer? Oops. 
Yeah, okay. Um, so this is the, um, what's known as the castle facade along 77th Street and building one here, which kind of got subsumed by that. Um, so the four square plan starts out, uh, but then thing, uh, things start to occupy courtyards. Areas that had been planned for light and air are now filled by um, uh, buildings dedicated to collection storage, perhaps without any visitor facing function. Um, so it begins to take on a more kind of, um, more kind of um, functional response um, and moves away from the master plan. And this is the, this is the state of the campus as we found it. 33 interconnected buildings ranging in their date of construction from the 1870s to the 2010s. Um, all different structural systems, all different materials, all different floor to floor heights, all different everything. Um, and our project is meant to reconnect and heal, I think the, to use some of the words that Lisa used, um, to connect um, and to animate the science and to inspire um, visitors to the museum to, to themselves dive deeper. So how did we think about achieving this? The, we, we tried to think like scientists, and the first thing we did was, well, not the first thing, um, but after reading the RFP and, <laughs> and a couple other things, we, uh, we, we started to think about a taxonomy or actually a morphology of the different um, types of buildings that comprise the campus, and there is a logic to it that we discovered. Um, so of course we have the axial halls that define the four square approach um, to the Vox plan kind of from the get-go. And then we have um, the turrets that mark corners or um, accent the entry pavilions. Iconic entries, one at each side of the super block, notably missing on the west side. Um, buildings, um, these are kind of some of the misbehaviors um, that we love, but they are um, filling in courtyards, perhaps where they shouldn't be. And then uh, we call these sidecars at one point, but we, I think the more polite term is additional infill buildings that are, um, these are these are really important buildings for science and research within the campus, but they um, they're some of, um, adding to some of the confusion with circulation. So our discovery here was to to say, okay, we need what we need to do is combine um, an axial hall building that's going to restore the clarity of the master plan with an iconic entry and, and use that as kind of the DNA of the project. So looking here at the um, before and after of the plan. Uh, you can see in red the, um, the outline of the original Vox plan before Theodore Roosevelt Park really came to occupy the super block um, in full along with the museum. Um, you can see the, um, what's really a bunch of backs of buildings here and the way that um, the Gilder Center, as we imagined it, fills in the space of this axial hall. Um, each of the pink arrows is one of the 10 buildings that we connect to. That's happening across six different floors, so um, 30 plus connections to existing buildings here. Um, all of these are would have been dead end moments in the circulation. And then um, also, as Lisa referenced, thinking beyond the footprint of our project to a new relationship, a new axial progression through the museum that is um, enabled by circling around the central element, which is um, today's the, Lef the Lefrac IMAX theater, um, but was ha had been originally imagined as the astronomical tower from, the, um, from that beautiful um, rendering that Lisa showed. Um, so as we started to think about what is the nature of this axial connection, we stumbled upon the concept of Manhattan Henge, um, which is, uh, a term I believe was coined by Neil deGrasse Tyson um, uh, of, of the Natural History Museum and um, is a perfect encapsulation of the relationship between the built environment and nature as we understand it in New York City. And, um, and it, is a, it is all about science and it's all about what people have created and the coming together of those two things. Um, and locating the building on the 79th Street axis, which is a, a prominent east-west cut through across Manhattan, we, we thought, you know, this, this this act that we're doing to restore the campus has a bigger urban meaning um, and is working at the urban scale as well. And um, this is one of my favorite images from the project, which is a collage that Jeannie made in the studio one day with some scissors. Xerox, uh, she, she found this print that she liked of these rocks, and um, I can't remember the artist's name, forgive me, and the Manhattan Henge image, and scotch taped it together, and it just kind of gelled our thinking, the whole team's thinking around what we were gonna do for this project. It was a kind of a watershed moment for us. Um, there I am with hair, so that, that gives you an idea of the, of the time arc of this project. Um, this is the, these are some of the earliest models made of the project. Um, 
and we stop in trying to express the access and and to create a nice iconic entry on Columbus Avenue this idea of a more sinuous more flowing form that was responding directly to the remit about connectivity and flow um, so the architecture itself is informed by flow and is helping to achieve flow and I also want to point out here this is a, an early very early workshop with our structural engineers from Arup um, who worked with us to, very, to at the get-go um, identify the challenges inherent in putting a building on top of the service yard that serves the whole campus where we need to be turning trucks around and dodging utility arteries and um, accommodating deliveries that serve the whole campus. So there's actually only a few places where the structure could touch down on the site, and that was an early important finding for the project as well. So um, as we moved in to develop this idea, we, we thought about how energy acts on natural materials obviously geology formed by water and wind and, and sand and erosion but also ice and other materials and um, started to really be interested in the idea of flow as it relates to the shaping of material um, so uh, from here we began to develop um, this central atrium space into something that would have more moments of more human scale that would not just be kind of walls like in a shopping mall but would be spaces that you could really inhabit that um, where people could find spaces that are scaled to their body and little moments and nooks of privacy and um, and relief from um, the the busy the busy life in the museum um, and we experimented with real materials and, um, and and material processes chemistry heat um, this is in february in chicago with a blowtorch on a on a block of ice and, and what we're doing here is not designing the building but we are just getting ideas um, and we're, we're examining the way that materials behaving uh, and this is informing the, um, the forms that we are developing we're moving from um, analog processes um, and and kind of hands-on material work to sketching which is always a really important part of our process and is a way that we begin to develop in this particular sketch resolving an idea of a stratified horizontal form with uh, moments where it would touch down at the proper place um, to coordinate with the service activities below and then moving that into physical model um, here's a, a handmade foam model that um, gives 3d dimension to the sketch and then moving it into a computer process um, we actually developed a custom script here that is um, it's uh, it's uh, it's allowing our rhino model to speak to revit to the bim model so we're, we're able to have a, a, a more um, fluid workflow with um, a, a software that works well for digital modeling complex forms but also able to have that plug into the the um, software that's creating the documentation for the project um, so ultimately, this is the Gilder Center, if you could see it without anything else around it. This is the structure of the Gilder Center, and this is the element that's holding up all the floor plates around it. This is a, it's a load-bearing structure, but it's also a space. So this is one of our favorite views of it, because you can't ever see this view, uh, but this is, it's, it's a structure that's doing work, and, and it's, it's, it's all about finding these connections into all the different nooks and crannies where it needs to connect to, and this is our, our favorite representation of that. So now how to build that? Um, and we, we left no stone unturned in terms of what is the appropriate materiality and construction technology for the project. Um, but this image was an important point in the process where we, um, we were thinking about fluid applied pneumatically, applied concrete, shotcrete. And there was, um, at the time, the construction going on for the East Side Access Project, several hundred feet below Grand Central Station, we were able to go down there and look at what the crew was doing down there. And we were really struck by the similarity of these forms, which are made by two tunnels meeting each other. It's called a fisheye. Um, the fisheye geometry is quite relevant to what we were looking at. And this was a kind of first hint that this approach could be the right one for us. A next step was to immediately get with the crews who do this kind of work and start to learn from them through a mock-up uh, process um, which this the mock-up on the left was done in Gowanus um, probably I don't remember what year it was and the mock-up on the right done in, in Wisconsin 
Here we're looking at, uh, on the image on the left, we're actually talking to um, the crew member here who's telling us what happens when they spray at different velocities and what kind of tools can they use to work on the surface after it's sprayed. The image on the right is looking at different aggregates and different sands and different aspects of the mix that are gonna give us different re um, reactions to light and different surface qualities. Um, we were really interested in the ability of this material to have a surface that does more than just be a surface. It is structure. It is also an important part of the acoustic strategy of the space. Um, the, the rod finish, it's called, which is made by running a rubber rod across the surface, um, gives a very beautiful kind of velvety texture in response to the natural light in the space and also makes it sound amazing. So when you go to the Gilder Center, you should listen to it. That's my favorite thing to do when I'm there. Um, and the, the, the rod finish is done by hand. So every square inch of the project is finished by a, a person and their hand, and um, they're moving their hand in accordance to some drawings that we made giving them the direction, which scrapes the aggregate through the fluid of the concrete and gives the whole surface a grain that we designed to kind of reinforce the flowing lines of the project. Um, the whole thing is done without formwork. So the only formwork we have in here is the temporary and reusable scaffolding that the crew would climb on to, to reach where they were spraying. And they're spraying into rebar and um, bent wire mesh, which, which receives the concrete and then um, sets there. And if there's any issues as they're doing it, it's able to be worked on before it cures. So very different from traditional cast in place in that way um, and a little bit more forgiving in that way. Um, and um, just that gives it a quite beautiful and more handcrafted appearance, which um, we, we quite like. It's, it's not a building that feels machined or robotic. It feels human and it feels, it, it feels like something relating to nature. Um, and that's part of our thinking about how to animate science and how to inspire people to um, be curious about what's around them and to feel the space um, as it relates to the mission of the project. The, the structure is developed through kind of also flowing gravity lines. So instead of just columns and slabs, the, the gravity kind of flows through it, which enables us to create these openings that are giving us specific views that we want um, to various aspects of the project. One of, the, one of my favorites here is the collections core, which is a four-story tower of collections, scientific collections, active collections, five million specimens out of the museum's 33-ish, 34 million uh, collections. <clears throat> specimens. Um, and so through this uh, beautiful exhibit, which is an exhibit about why the museum collects, um, visitors are actually able to see the scientists accessing objects in the collection through, through that exhibit. And this is a kind of x-ray drawing that shows the, um, the vertical position of the collection's core within the project and the openings in the shotcrete wall that are giving views to and from it on different levels. I'll quickly step through the, um, the, the primary program components of the museum now, of the Gilder Center, starting with um, the insectarium, which is positioned in a really great spot right near where all the kids arrive in buses. And they come into the Gilder Center through what here, what is called the pollination portal, where there are all these models of insects scaled 20 times natural size. And they, so you're kind of shrunk down to the scale of an insect and, and you're invited to inhabit that world. Um, directly above that is the live butterfly vivarium, which is a really amazing space um, to be immersed in beautiful butterflies all around you. It's also quite humid in there and warm. The, uh, there are uh, suites, several suites of classrooms um, that um, serve children from a very young age up to adult learners. Um, this one here is um, one that's dedicated to science data visualization. Um, the space for that is the kind of green projection space on the right. And then um, pushing the idea of um, visualizing scientific data to the extreme is the Invisible Worlds Experience, which is a um, really amazing immersive space um, with projection around all sides of you and the floor that takes you through different environments um, of scale um, so that you can, um, you can inhabit um, a, a root network in the forest or inhabit the, uh, the ocean with plankton being the size of a plankton. So it's really, Really amazing, and all of the um, all of the digital experience here based on data that the, um, that is from the scientists at the museum. Um, the Natural History Library, which is one of the largest collections in the world, I believe, Natural History Collections, um, which is a, a wonderful space um, where folks are a quiet space where folks are invited to to sit and um, 
and do some reading or um, enjoy the space. And um, scholars from all over will come to make use of this incredible collection or able to, uh, to interact with some of the amazing things that they have in this collection. Things like Darwin's notebooks, amazing. Also a Banksy, which is one of my favorites. Um, and then um, moments throughout where um, folks are just invited to sit and contemplate. And we thought that is something that was needed at the museum, just a place to sit and to, you're, you're receiving so much information here. Um, why don't you just take a minute and think about it and think about um, how amazing what you're seeing is and, and just take a moment to reflect. So I'll finish here with just, um, for the interior, with just some different shots around the building. Um, there's some lights in the floor that um, illuminate the structure from below in the evening, giving it kind of a campfire glow. Um, all sorts of places where you can peek across and see something across the way from you and gives you an idea where you want to go and a bridge to get there. Uh, different scales of space that um, are comfortable for folks to sit in. A little peekaboo there. Um, and then um, the this, this stair which you encounter if you enter from Central, uh, from, excuse me, from um, Columbus Avenue and from the park, which has become a kind of favorite spot for folks to sit and hang out and um, Instagram and, and do what they do. Um, I'll, I'll finish with just um, some uh, description of the exterior of the building. Um, this is a drawing that we made um, looking at how we could achieve an idea of geological and um, geological stratification and cross bedding in the facade. Um, we we're really interested in um, something very textural, but using uh, material that was already present in the in the museum, and so we were able to um, source Milford paint granite from the Milford Quarry in Massachusetts, which is the exact same quarry where the stone comes from uh, for the um, Theodore Roosevelt Rotunda building, which is on Central Park West. So a really nice material story as well. Uh, this really beautiful stone um, ranges from slightly pinkish to slightly grayish, and um, when uh, when cut into these cur slightly curving panels, to me, almost has the appearance of soap. It's just like, just want to touch it. It's really beautiful, um, beautiful surface quality. Um, these are some of the panels um, being made where the pieces of stone are attached to, um, to steel frames to be picked and put onto the building. So the shotcrete structure com basically comes outside, flows from the inside outside. Um, so this is what's behind the stone, shotcrete structure, and then the panels are attached to that. Um, and you can see the, the leave out panels, that's where the actual panels are bolted to the facade and those are all um, covered over and this is the result, the exterior. So that it's designed in its tone and its texture and its color to be very continuous with the interior shotcrete material um, right along this line, which is one of the most technically challenging moments of the project where the shotcrete surface just comes right out perfectly coplanar with um, the um, the stone surface, which also has insulation and waterproofing and other stuff behind it. So it's really all about that continuity and that flow and the connectivity to the park, which is also a, a nice new thing for the museum to have an, an entry that's this accessible and this connected to, um, to the neighborhood, the community, and the park. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Look forward to speaking to you. Thank you for those presentations, which really told us so much. It was very, very uh, detailed and fascinating to hear about this. Um, I want to start by asking you, um, uh, and it's a word you used a lot. Ian Forster had a phrase, only connect. And he meant it for literature, but it really applies to institutions, uh, cultural institutions particularly, and, and this one especially. And I wonder, in a you know, he wrote way back when, in a world where we don't have the same standards, values, or you can't assume the same standards and values across the, uh, the cultures uh, or our culture, how, how do you go about connecting to today? Hmm. Well, I think, um, I mean, what I'll speak about maybe first is, is our visitors themselves, because I think that while the building is meant to support the scientific research program and the library program, and we have here our director of the library as a special guest. Um, hi, Tom. So if there's library questions, we have a ringer in the audience. But I think that what I would say is it's about conversations. It's about supporting 
conversations among and between our visitors and prompting dialogue. And that dialogue, we hope, extends to what people observe and how we can know things um, through our own experience, um, as well as making connections between topics and between the visitors and, and in essence, the result of the scientific enterprise which isn't always understood as having derived from a laboratory upstairs. Mm. But I think that our visitors by and large um, understand the museum to be a place that is trusted. And I think that that is born of some of the designs that you saw, but also the history of how interpretive design in terms of exhibition and education is undertaken. And, and thinking about how to do that in the changing world and where there are disagreements about certain core theories of science um, is a challenge. Um, do you think, Wes, that uh, spatially, architecturally, things need to connect in a different way than the, you know, the Beaux-Arts strict hierarchy, which the master plan represented? Were you seeking to you know, connect in a different way? Yeah, to, to connect in many different ways, I think. Um, we, so the word connect is so like deeply embedded in every aspect of this project. There's just obviously connecting to physically connecting to the neighboring buildings. There's creating visual um, and intellectual connections to the content of the museum through the porous aspect of the of the structure. Um, thinking about sight lines, thinking about flow lines, um, being able to orient yourself. Um, within the space and then being able to see something else that you might want to go to as a form of connection sequence. Um, and and the, the connective nature of the material and the way that the form expresses the connection between material and energy in nature. And I think um, we could probably point to nature as, as something that transcends our differences in terms of um, inspiring us um, to feel Something, something powerful and something emotional. And so what a joy to get to work on a project where that was our goal, to get to work on a project where um, we could wrestle with the question, what is architecture that inspires people? What is a building that will, want, that will get people in the mindset to connect with what this place has to offer? And so I just, I, I could talk about that word forever because I think it's just, <laughs> it is the word of the project. And, um, uh, so hopefully, we're, hopefully it ends up being able to, to do some of that. I always imagine that the most fun part of any architectural project is when the client and the architect start traveling the world looking at great examples of, uh, of what their project's going to be. Did you do that kind of research for this? We did extensively in yeah, building you... the program, mm -hmm. um, what we had hoped to um, put in to the RFP. And I think, you know, it, it informed us a great deal. Um, and I think also one of the connections I think that, that we spoke about, but that is very important is, is the connection to the past, the legacy of an organization mm -hmm. as old as we are, but making a connection to a new generation. And I think some of the projects we looked at were museums and other civic spaces that really were not as historically bound mm -hmm. as we were. Mm -hmm. And so when Jeannie's proposal came in that was able to bridge the history and the future, I think that it really resonated for us because of some of the other projects we had seen around the world. What were some of the uh, places oh, wow. that excited you the most? Well, I'm sure it's, it's, um, it's very personal um, in some sense. I think, um, you know, we certainly looked at the Cal Academy building closely mm -hmm. um, in San Francisco. Um, you know, they thought deeply about their mission being really focused on sustainability and climate. And mm -hmm. so their building, for those of you that know it, was a very important exemplar for us. Um, that's one that really stands out. I think there are other examples that really brought us to a deeper understanding about how to present content through science visualization. Those were less museum-based and more commercial, candidly, buildings. Um, and, um, but I, but I would say that, that um, museums as a whole have been through an, a revolution and evolution. And, um, and there were several examples that were important to us. Probably the Perot Museum in Dallas played a role in some of the thinking, which we can talk more about. But also, 
you know, we saw some strategies that maybe wouldn't fit for us as well, mm -hmm. and that was useful um, as well. And Wes, did you, I mean, it brings to mind Mendelssohn's uh, Potsdam Tower or even Friedrich Kiesler's, uh, you know, Endless House. Did you look at those kinds of, you know, historic organic forms? Absolutely. I, I would add to that um, Arab Saarinen. I, we, we're particularly interested in the structural expression side. So not the gooey for gooey's sake, but for, <laughs> um, but for um, really clear and strong um, expressions of real structure, because that's what, you, I think that's what gives the building the authenticity. Um, we did not want to create a shape that you would go knock on and it would be hollow. We wanted to create a structure that you can inhabit. And so um, when we think about some of the great works of architecture that achieve these kinds of fluid spaces that are so directly structural and give you that kind of, um, that, that feeling of being so, you just intuitively understand it. I would put Saren in that category. Um, you know, we, we love Gaudi, we, and we, we lean into all of these um, comparisons and are, and are happy to be uh, uh, even mentioned in the company of those, yeah. <laughs> and has shot creep, which, uh, fun fact, it turns out, Lisa, why don't you tell the story of the shot creep? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know the whole story, only that, that Akeley, um, who was one of our founding scientists, um, discovered it, right, really? Invented and it. And invented yeah. it. And so the fact that that material became so relevant um, to the studio gang was wonderful. Did you know that in, in advance? Was we that discovered that during the process. And I was reading up on that again recently. Um, the story is, according to Wikipedia, um, <laughs> the story is that um, he- probably that, has the records, right? <laughs> you, he was, he was working, at the, he was re doing facade restorations at the Field Museum and developed this technique. Um, so it wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't invent it for his dioramas. Um, it was to do an architectural repair. Yeah. Now, has it been used on, uh, at a lot, at such a scale? Well, it, it, it has been used at much bigger scale. So we, we were trying to move it from, um, 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 like tunnel infrastructural scale, mm. it, it has its beginnings um, for, like with buildings and foundations and underground structures, mm. um, also swimming pools if you're in LA. Um, so um, I think things that are resisting hydrostatic and resisting moisture in the ground, it was a um, it was used for, um, but um, it had not been used at this level of detail and this level of exuberance, let's say. Um, but so load, that was our shot. But load bearing is really useful. Oh, yeah, right. I yeah. mean, it has the same capacities as, uh, as it's concrete. Mm -hmm. um, and what, there's interesting things you can do with it. You can change the thickness of it um, depending how much you spray. So mm -hmm. it, actually, the thickness of, the, of our walls is, is, is varying from several feet thick to some inches thick. Oh, wow. um, and that's all done, again, working with Arab, who um, helped us in a really detailed way understand how the wall was walls were performing and where the lows were going, and you can really dial it in yeah. in a way that you're not able to do with conventional cast in place. So there must have been some, you know, the pandemic was going on and a lot of this project was, you know, already underway. There must have been some challenges and surprises in terms of, you know, you know vision meeting construction. <laughs> can you tell us about some of those? You want to start that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the challenges were um, across the board, right? Yeah. From from how to make strong decisions in the context of being remote, to managing uh, supply chain, um, to making on the fly decisions. How did you manage decisions. supply chain? Well, we we didn't is yeah. the answer. It managed, um, us. <laughs> it managed us. Um, but I think you know. Well, one, I want to say that 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 the challenges were. Um, Profound, um, including yeah. all the mundane things like funding and mm. financing, um, and also really staying current with the project. So, with every problem, there was an, also an opportunity to say, "Is this an opportunity to change something?" Right? Because the designs by then could could be updated um, in some regards, especially the exhibition design, which we took advantage of when we had to retool. Um, I think that um, what I do want to say is that the idea of the building that Wes presented carried us through. It, the vision, the strength of that idea, that it was novel, that it was hard to accomplish, that we didn't quite know what it was going to turn out was the motivator for us and for the communities that supported us, which were numerous. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it really took that amount of 
public will, civic will, in addition to brilliant designers and architects and other people like that. So, so yes, hugely challenging, yeah. hugely challenging project. And when, I mean, I just wanna um, compliment our client because it's, it's that spirit of exploration and discovery that is the museum that that's, you don't get to have a client that is um, interested in that kind of journey that often. So I just really, um, I'm, I'm so um, grateful for, for the, the relationship and the, and the trust and the partnership that we together embarked on this journey because it was in, in, in many moments a foray into the unknown and we worked really hard to get ahead of every single thing we could but um, it was the spirit of discovery and curiosity mm -hmm. and uh, that is at the end of the day what's legible on the building. It is, you can feel that and I think that is um, the, the fact that um, the museum um, went that way with the project speaks volumes to how they kind of talk, they walk the talk. The, it, 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 had, it went from a half acre in size and the community was concerned about some trees being removed and I think it went down to a quarter, a, a quarter acre. And were there any favorite things that were lost in that translation? Well, in order to move the building eastward to conserve mm -hmm. the seven trees, um, which is the quarter acre in the south node. So um, mm -hmm. if you look at the building with your back to Columbus, it's the part of the building that, it, that is of the south. Um, it is that quarter acre um, that in order to conserve, um, we needed to remove in, um, two buildings in order to move the building further eastward. Mm -hmm. So one of the design changes that was significant was the discovery that those U2 utilitarian buildings um, should be eliminated in order to achieve the goals of the project and conserve the open space. Mm -hmm. um, what we ended up fighting for, and fighting um, we did, um, was the opportunity to create the connections, your point again, to that building that is the southern building to Gilder now that contains the Genman Mineral Hall mm. and the South American People's Hall and the Pacific People's Hall and a set of um, scientific floors. So if that node hadn't been able to be part of the project, which the litigation was an attempt to stop that connection, we really would have lost some very, very deep and important opportunities, mm -hmm. um, both intellectually and for our visitors. Um, but the project was modified in order to conserve that quarter acre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other things that kind of were uh, left on the floor from your point of <laughs> vantage point that you wish had stayed well, in? I'm, I'm thinking about that moment in the project. Um, there's um, a, that small building that came down ultimately did allow us to connect into the center a little bit more seamlessly. It, does, it yes. reaches yeah. really to the to the center where that original tower We would have had to kind in. of go around. So there was yeah. some real, there, that, there were some silver linings there for sure. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's a lot of experimentation that was able to happen as the construction proceeded with how the exhibits would occupy the space. With, um, we were talking about the, the grand stair element, and which was a, a new thing um, in the museum that took some experimenting to figure out how to um, properly set it up so that it would be safe and comfortable. So we were, there was kind of things that we were able to play with along the way as well. Mm -hmm. Talk a little about the grand stair. I mean, it, since time immemorial, I mean, the Met has them inside and outside, but it seems in recent decades, stairs have become, you know, the Cooper Union right over here has a big event stair. And so what did you ask, did you ask for an event stair, or how did it evolve? And is it working, or what do you want it to do? Yeah, I mean, it's working probably better than we had ever imagined. One of the discoveries um, that Wes mentioned was that this is an entry at grade, so it's our only fully accessible mm -hmm. entrance um, in terms of physical accessibility. But in fact, the main floor of the museum is the second floor. It's the floor that uh. contains the great rotunda, the Theodore Roosevelt's memorial. And so we knew we had to bridge, in essence, from the first floor to the second floor. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in the discovery of moving the building as far eastward um, that there was a discovery that there was an opportunity, if you will, to create a moment for visitors to bridge from, from one floor to the other. 
but to do it in a way that wasn't utilitarian, where the other mm. steps really were. They're encased in marble in the memorial. Yeah. Um, and so this is an opportunity also to have the building describe how one is meant to move through the building, which was also novel for us, right? In every other building, it's invisible how to get really from one floor to another. Um, I would say that one of the greatest things about this building is how the stair and the first and second floor absorb visitors to a much greater extent than we mm. thought. So for us now, a day that would be unpleasantly crowded um, is not so. And that's a very significant feature for a museum that aims to serve the public. Are you tracking with people which entrance are they using the Theodore Absolutely. Roosevelt or they've shifted over? So we are having um, so we are having a very hard time convincing our visitors that there is no line on Columbus Avenue and they should not stand out in the rain on Central Park West. Any ideas are welcome of how to convince people that to move. Um, what I would say is that it's turning out to be just about what we did in terms of the environmental impact statement, which is about 20% of our visitors are using the Columbus Avenue entrance with um, the subway entrance and the Central Park West entrances being our primary entrance mm -hmm. and the Rose Center being our second entrance. Um, so that's proving out, but we're very much hoping that the Gilder Center becomes a more popular entry. Um, it's a popular exit, right? It's a very popular <laughs> exit. Yeah. So um, you, come in, you come in from the main level museum at the top of the stair when you're coming from the rear of the Gilder Center. Uh, so, and we were thinking about that. But that's we, we were We had this data. Um, and so how do you make a building that is exited through yeah. um, uh, on your way to Shake Shack? You need slides. Yeah. You need I mean, I will say one. that this is part of the invention of, of how visitors absorb information. We had always had a very formal idea that people had to flow from A, gallery to B, to C, to, you know, and we had a sense of what that looked like. And I think this building has just invited that this flow is now part of the educational and interpretive facilitation of the museum in a way that, that we used to have a more formal idea of people moving through academic disciplines or types of specimens and artifacts. What kind of architectural tricks did you have to do? Because the floor levels were not oh. all <laughs> remotely the same. If you bring a level to, <laughs> there's some subtle ramp. Uh, we tried to do it invisibly, but there's, um, there's very subtle ramping. What was, what was the most extreme uh, instance of that? Um, you know, over a foot. And wow. um, so we, we, and we didn't want to be having handrails and landings, so that's all yeah. done quite carefully. Um, and there's different measures that need to be taken, um, like fire separation shutters and those mm -hmm. sorts of things um, that are all pretty well hidden, I think. Um, but really, that is a lot, of, a lot of that work is, the kind of, is let's call it unglamorous, um, but, but is what, what's required to heal. It's, it's the work that to work with what's there and improve what's there and, and breathe new life into it is the real work of the project. The, fa the, the facade, which is quite beautiful, that's only just a teeny part of it. So in that way, we liken the project to a mushroom. You, most of it is the mycelium that is <laughs> under the ground that's doing all the work and communicating and moving nutrients around. And then there's this one little pretty part <laughs> on the front. Um, but I, I do, I, I want to, you know, all of our, uh, we have a lot of people from the um, design and engineering team here tonight, Burrow Happold, Arup, um, and others. And uh, there's just so much work from so many people that went into those details that are never seen um, and um, is, is an absolutely critical part of the project. Historically, a lot of natural history museums took kind of a cabinet of curiosities approach. And, and also, you know, with the dim lighting and the kind of mysterious things that you had to discover by kind of stumbling around in the half dark, did you want to, re you know, which created a great, um, you know, m magical sense, a mysterious yeah. sense. Right. Yeah. And did you want to uh, preserve that in any way, or is that just, a, you know, an old, you know, it's not an information loaded approach because, you know, just the, you know, North American antlered, you know. Well, I guess what it raises up for me is the role of the Invisible Worlds Theater. Um, mm -hmm. So, and the comparison between that sort of three dimensional diorama, if you will, and the traditional dioramas, which yeah. of course were at the time represented a specific latitude and longitude, a day of week, a day of the month, a very precise. And, and I think that for communicating environmental change, those exhibits are really unparalleled and, and maintain their 
And they're, they continue to be robust in terms of the earth science halls and the diorama halls in communicating um, very important principles of, of, of geologic and species diversity. I think the stories in the Gilder Center um, were in part selected, both in the case of the theater, for stories that were really inspired by the Ames Powers of Ten movie from mm. the 1970s of looking at not just beyond the earth, but within the earth and within our bodies. But the other exhibits, I would say, dealing with the natural light that was in this building was a very significant mm. feature of the design process. Would you agree? Yeah. And so for us, it was an enormous challenge working with Ralph Applebaum, as well as our own exhibition lead, Lori Halderman, to tell stories where there would be natural light and studying that very carefully. So the collections core that rises, which is in effect a building within a building, each of those arrays were studied for the light effect on the specimens. So I would say that um, it was not easy to discover how to tell natural history stories with that amount of natural light. Mm. And so one of the most incredible, we knew that visitors would find the natural light, which I think has been proven out, to be an opportunity to stay longer, to relax, uh. to also have, to re-energize. But we also, of course, were very concerned about the specimens and the light sensitivity of, this, of the objects themselves. So, that, I would say, building the insectarium was as much a, an exploration of that field of science, of insects and arthropods, than it was about light studies. Yeah. And so the, the beehive being in the window was because it was, of course, made of you know, inorganic material. <laughs> and that as you move, in essence, eastward, we were able to do more, if you will, natural history storytelling. But the role of screens in the building, I mean, all mm. of this had to be studied in a way that those other buildings didn't require light studies. Mm. And architecturally, how did you want to spatialize adventure or, you mm. know, excitement, you know, that, that thing that kids discover when they're exploring on their own? I think um, if we compare it to the Cabinet of Curiosities approach, I would say we're, what we were after is something experiential and immersive. So. Um, being and always attentive to scale. Scale, I think, mm -hmm. is, a, is up, right up there with connection uh, in terms of a, a mm -hmm. critical theme for the project. So you have extreme moments of expansion and contraction of the space mm -hmm. around you, and um, that is continued into the exhibits and the, um, the way that um, Ralph Applebaum's team makes you kind of the size of an insect um, and and cross cuts the content with themes not about just how things look but what they do and how they communicate and um, how they're interacting with things like public health and critical topics like species loss the insects tell so many stories that way um, but um, the the Im immersion in it um, and in the whole and in the ideas of it as opposed to being confronted with an array of it um, is um, i think a, a nice aspect, although the collection's core is an array, it's more, it's telling the story of how that array is used, mm. um, which is also immersing you in the work of a scientist, seeing a scientist, hearing from a scientist, hopefully being inspired to become a scientist. That core collection is amazing. How often will it change? Because it looks like it's set up to, you know, move. Well, one of the features of the museum is that we are still collecting um, carefully, um, primarily, um, data, but also genomic material that we store in, in collection storage that are microbial and molecular samples. So, um, but I think that the idea is that those stories would be updated, um, both in terms of new collections, but also the stories about how we collect, why we collect, what meaning is made of the collections, and who's doing the collecting. To, hmm. to Wes's point, we really want to reveal the, how that work is done, not making it revealed in a sort of magical way, as you described it. What about the education spaces? They're very developed, and I know museums all over are increasing uh, the space they devote to education. Yeah. And you've already been devoted to that from the get-go, but what percentage of the new program is devoted to education spaces that are not generally open to the public? Well, um, we have 13 new and renovated classrooms. Um, by square feet, I don't know, you might know, um, some of the best views. The some of the best views. <laughs> um, what I would say is that the, the education spaces were definitely giving pride of place, no question. 
Um, and we wanted to have space that not only supported the instructions, um, instructional capacity, but we also wanted to reveal the educational enterprise, like we wanted to reveal the collections and scientific enterprise for the general public, so people could understand that this was not necessarily an experience that started or ended with a visit, no. but we, we also have online and other programs for children and adults alike. So, so the classrooms have been really a hive of activity since we started, and the educators love being in them. We also have spent the summer inviting in teachers um, to understand how to utilize the halls to teach important themes in their own curriculum. And then, of course, we are really asking young people to co-invent with us at this point in terms of the future of the role of museums in the lives of young people and their passion about issues of climate and environment and their own futures. Mm -hmm. And so the Gilder Center, I think, really has a the flow, the scale, I think communicates to people that are there for instruction, not only for a museum visit, that this is a place that is open to them and where their voice matters. And I think that's probably the most moving part of, yeah. of the Gilder Center is to see young people yeah. on the bridges and traversing and flowing in their own way and in their, with their own patterns of movement. Now that I've warmed you up, I want to ask about your relationship, your working relationship. <laughs> and I'm sure each of you has something in the process, long years of this project where each of you wanted something and had to talk the other into getting it. Can you each give an example of something you had to convince the other player <laughs> to, to, to give? Um, <clears throat> let's well, I can give an example of something that wasn't given. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, definitely, let's rehash that. <laughs> um, I would say that I'll, I might get a little emotional, but Wes's commitment to the educational work of the museum, he sat in classes, he observed teachers, uh -huh. He, you know, his his want to not just build a classroom, but for to make it alive. And at some point I asked whether, you know, walls that might be, you know, um, not curved would be possible. Because... So what we did was... Two, <laughs> what, we did, what we did was, instead of a curving wall, we did two straight parts with a little curve. <laughs> In so as long as you can put some furniture up against right. that, it's good to go. And you wanted right? to be able to put the chairs against the wall. Yeah, oh, only to say that I think, you know, one of the advantages of a long project like this, and, uh, and it was long, is that, is that we also were able to learn from one another, right? Yeah. So the, the, the educators were able to meet with Wes and talk about, well, how am I going to actually do the kind of instructional work I do? in this kind of space with all this beautiful light and air, but how is it going to work? Yeah. And I think, so that's an example of where we, I think, came to a meeting of the minds. I think that was, there was a, wasn't that a problem at the Guggenheim as well? <laughs> yes, yeah. Also shot creep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that was one example. You, yeah. you might have less. Yes. Um, putting me on the spot here. Um, I mean, I, you referenced, um, taking the opportunity to revisit things late in the process. Yes. So I think that yes. was maybe a little bit more of a challenge that I don't know how visible that may have been. Um, you know, things like um, um, moving for, for good reason and to improve the project, moving program around kind of late in the process mm, was, yeah. was something that was um, difficult to achieve at certain moments. Um, you know, we went through, um, slightly veering off the, the thrust of your question, but we went through um, a robust community process that was, you know, just took a lot of um, dedication and commitment and mm -hmm. partnership and ha had its tough moments. And um, we, there was challenge when you're, if you've ever like renovated your kitchen, you know that you find stuff. So just imagine that times five billion. And that's this project. I mean, just constant <laughs> discovery of, um, oh, we can't do that idea anymore because we just found out this thing's in the way and that's over there. Mm -hmm. and, and so just like constant influx of new information as we began to disassemble that um, required a lot of um, creative problem solving and coming to our client and saying, hey, this is, you need a new plan. Um, so I think um, lots of little things like that along the way. Um, mm -hmm. But we, um, I think the, we, we felt that the, um, the essence, we were able to preserve the essence of the project through those through those things. Mm. 
And Lisa, when the ice block and the blowtorch came along, yeah. and you saw and you saw this as as a yeah. uh, inspiration for for the natural for the natural formations, did you? love it right off the bat? Did the, the board and the deciding people embrace, you know, the, the geological approach? Well, I think it's, it's such a great question. I, I mean, I just want to say that, that part of the discovery that we went through in this idea that you um, shared about connections um, is to understand that the architectural history of the campus was very much that each building reflected the age that it was built in. And that brought the board and, and our president, Ellen Futter, and the chairman, Louis Bernard, to, and the chair of our Buildings and Grounds Committee, to really understand the, the, the relevance and the currency mm -hmm. of the design approach that was being brought, and that it wasn't something we could have heard five years previous, and we may not hear today, but it was, you know, of that moment. I think that um, the passion that was brought forward with the blowtorch and the ice cube, which we still talk about. I mean, I just want to say, I had a meeting today where we talked it's about irresistible. the ice. Um, and, um, but it also embodied Jean, Jeannie and, and Wes's and the team's way of working, which was so experiential, mm -hmm. right? It was such, so based on inquiry and a shared passion for that, that the board really did fall in love with the project and fell in love with it in the dimensions we've described, scientifically, architecturally, culturally. I think that, um, so yeah, I think, I think we did. I, I don't think, there was not a close second, I would yeah. say, in the competition. Maybe others might have a different remembering of that. But, um, but I would say that, that it did take um, it did take a steadfast quality on the, you know, on the part of the board and the staff um, to just manage how non-traditional this really was. Mm -hmm. And the blowtorch and ice might have been a, um, a, a an early <laughs> indication of just how novel it was going to be, but we didn't understand that. And I would only say that that, that that aspect of the project of doing things that we had never done before as an organization mm -hmm. persisted until the day before opening. I mean, it, it was that yeah. intense, I think, yeah. for in a sustained way. I think the, the facade is interesting in this story because we have the inside, which is kind of, you can understand it, and then we have the context, which is a Romanesque, Richardsonian Romanesque building over here and a like industrial powerhouse building over here from the from the, 20s, I think. And so the facade ends up being the thing that negotiates those. And um, to bring that uh, to, it was all about getting, it was not about trying to replicate anything. It was about a connection through material and a close study of proportion, alignment, um, and looking at how all the other buildings of the campus related to each other, even though we may not realize that they're 100 years apart in age yeah. or 80 years apart in age. Beaux-Arts on Central Park West is a world away from Victorian Gothic in Building 1, even though a lot of people might look at it and just say, oh, it's old. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have high-tech modern in the Rose Center. We have all of the perf all of the best representations of their time on this campus. It's, a, it's an exhibit of architecture in, this, in the city of New York. And so I think um, that was the approach, and uh, we were able to bring that to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and it was unanimously approved on the first vote because it was it is true it's authentic to that place that approach um, but it doesn't mean that we uh, didn't we weren't held to a super high standard of and rigor of how we were going to relate to the context and, and advance it in a responsible way we just have a minute before the we open to questions but i have one last question for you in 1995 Herbert Mouchamp uh, commissioned Cal Santiago Calatrava to do right. a time capsule. And I was yes. there at the ribbon cutting uh -huh. for that, which I think was right back there. Is it still, where did that time capsule go? Time's capsule is, is coming to the front of the Rose Center on 81st Street. Um, so it's being relocated. Ah. Um, I don't know quite when. Is it in good, is it in good shape? <laughs> Soon. It is in great shape. It's been conserved as a work of art, which of course it is, and it had occupied the, the ground 
really almost right where the Gilder entrance to the new building is. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, and it was um, a beautiful, beautifully sited, and it will be again. And oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful Good piece of work. Know. Yes. We will now open the floor to questions. If, if uh, I think there's a roving uh, microphone around. Oh, the, oh, no, step up to the microphones on the side. Hi, I'm Kate. Thank you guys uh, for speaking to us. I, there's a little bit of feedback. Okay? We can hear you. Can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much for your work. Um, I uh, feel uncomfortable in a lot of modern architecture, and I haven't been yet, but just looking, um, you've made a really comfortable as well as awe-inspiring place. Um, that said, it is the Natural History Museum, and I'm curious what elements of botany or nature, water you had thought about. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, um, flow is a, is a important <clears throat> idea throughout the project. The, the, the fluid aspect of concrete literally makes it possible to, um, to achieve the forms that we achieved. And I, I remember, um, uh, Mike Novacek, the um, provost of the museum, commenting that he saw bones in the in the in the forms that we were creating, and, and we were really taken by that because it's not just about geology, and it's not a representation of geology. It's about how forces in the natural world impact all of us, our bodies, and the material world around us. So I really loved that perspective on the project, and I think it you know not necessarily botany, but I think, sure, some aspects of um, the physiology and structure of a plant could be, um, could be um, legible in the project and the landscape. Yeah, I only want to add that Reed Hildebrand, a landscape architect, um, designed the exterior. So there is quite a lot of effort at um, introducing native species and talking about the role of pollination and urban biodiversity. So one of the features in the exhibition design in the Insectarium is not only a celebration of distant locales, you know, the traditional dioramas of faraway places, but celebrating the biodiversity that's in New York. Um, and so there's a explicit connection between the park and, and the building in terms of native plants and the relationship between um, species in the city, including in public parks. Hi. Um... Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the role of the script that you guys used in the design process of the form. Sure. Um, so uh, one of those important moment decision points in the project for us was what software are we going to are we going to use to do this? And uh, we undertook a research project. Um, to determine what were going to be the right tools, because really this project was going to going to live or die uh, uh, on selecting the right tools to to achieve it, and it's a decision that's hard to undo. So um, <clears throat> we narrowed it down to two contenders: Maya and T splines. I don't think they make T splines anymore. T splines is a is a, a surface modeling plugin for Rhino that allows you to um, it's like clay in digital, so you can really um, sculpt and sh and shape. Um, intuitively, as opposed to geometrically, like laying out, laying out definition points and, and you know geometrically laying things out, which is totally not the vibe of the project. The project, the vibe is is clay, and so um, <clears throat> that we were getting the best results from that software. So then the but we knew the project was it's a highly technical job. It's going to need to be documented through a building information model. So how do we marry those together? And um, we worked with a group called the Proving Ground. Um, it's a, a consultancy in, I think, Kansas, I want to say. Um, and they, um, on, this is on the design team side. I don't think um, the client ever had to deal with any of this. But um, we, we were able to develop a script that would move the model from the Rhino environment, which was modeled in T-splines, into the BIM model as a smart object so that all the four plates could clip into it and the, um, we could generate the appropriate views that became the sheets and the drawing set, et cetera. So it was a translational 
um, translational piece of software. You say that the form was more manually developed and that it was just a tool used to kind of smooth out some details or did it like more kind of I, I, I like to think of it as perfectly both. It's perfectly a balance cool. of both and that's what's beautiful about it. it is, it's not something that you could do by hand only and it's definitely not something that you could do in a computer only. So creating physical objects, learning from them, representing them in sketch and then bringing that into a digital environment is one direction and then figuring out problems and creating surface geometries in a digital environment. Sometimes, sometimes a trick that we do, which is great, is we model something in a digital environment and then we just draw it by hand over. And in that act, you completely change the, um, you completely change the, I want to say emotion of it. it. It goes from being this abstract thing that is somehow foreign and alien to something that is human. And so that's a trick that we use that I would encourage students to play around with because it, it get you can, it's, it's not a choice between technology like tech and analog, digital and analog. It's, it's, the, it's the skill of bringing them together in an interesting way. I think that's where we're at right now. So fascinating. Our scientists would say the same thing. Just <laughs> very interesting hearing you talk Thank about, you. about the object and the imaging and CAT scanning and genomic study that, so it's yeah. the synthesis of, of Both of and, that. not either or. Yeah, they call it total evidence, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so just inspired by Wes. Hi, um, I recently visited the museum. This is super, Thank super you very fascinating, much. so beautiful. Um, I was curious about the color. Um, I wanted to hear more about like how you guys land on this color. It's such a bright space, so it like makes sense. But curious if there were other color ways you guys considered and what that ideation was like to land on this. I know it's partly based on the material, but I'm sure there was probably a lot of range in there. That's that's one that we batted around quite a lot. Bat batted um, <laughs> is an interesting choice. Uh, well, listen, I mean, Wes described um, the challenge of the coloration, um, and I would say that, um, you know, describing what the, as, as the Landmarks Commission standard calls for appropriateness, and so the discussion about what level of matching was appropriate, given that the material had an echo on Central Park West, but not north and south, proved to be a very interesting and complicated um, discussion, not only within the design team and with us, but also with preservationists and other experts. And then, and then it was trial by error. I mean, really, to select the right color. And then, of course, the, the, the granite, because of how it was cut and applied, took on light that was also surprising in terms yeah. of the choice of color. We, um, we Warm, warmth and coolth, I think, was at the core of this debate. Um, we ultimately felt like going red pink on the interior was not the right way. Um, the, not, the, not the way we want to go aesthetically, but also was not going to do us any favors in terms of bouncing light deep in. And we just felt like um, something a little more on the cool and neutral side was really going to make it pop and really going to um, give us the rendering we wanted of light and shadow and make it possible to really sense all the edges and creases and um, curvature of the project. Um, and this is this isn't like you just have a color chip and this is what you get. This is a this is chemistry of cement and sand and gravel um, physics. and physics and um, and it's not uniform. So if you go and look. Um, they're called cold joints, which is what happens between in this in conventional concrete pours. In this case, is sprays. The crew can spray for a day, and then they go home, and then they come back the next day and have a new batch, and they start again. And um, it's never exactly the same between those two days, which we managed um, with these creases in the form, which are where the cold joints happen. So you're going to see on one side of the crease a little bit more shadow, and on the other side a little bit more light. So it kind of plays up that difference. Um, and there's we embrace the, the, some of the natural aspects of the material, some moments of splotchiness, some uh, variations in texture. That's like really interesting to us for this project, um, but it's not one color. Um, but we, we moved it towards a lighter and more neutral color. And then the amazing trick with the Milford Pink Granite, it had, we have range samples where we said, okay, um, you can use stones that are between this amount of gray and this amount of pink. 
and then they quarried the blocks and we have a range of stones from greater pink so it perfectly transitions from the more neutral interior to a little bit more warm on the exterior and then you have um, a red brick building on one side and a, um, I think it's called Pitkin Island granite brownish on the other side so it's there's some subtlety to it that maybe you wouldn't know unless you had poured over it for a long time but it, um, there's intentionality behind the materials that, that has to do with um, but equal, in equal measure the um, what we wanted the experience inside the building to be and how it would relate to the context. And one follow up on that, what was, I guess, how did you find ways to prototype what that could look like mm -hmm. in a space where like light is coming in and you kind of have to see it all together, maybe to see like the final vision of it? Like were there ways yeah. to test what that felt like? So yeah, I showed you a bunch of mock-ups, but then when they started spraying on site, we definitely had okay. test areas. Mm -hmm. um, and we had parts that we cut out and we did because they weren't right. And that is possible to do with sh the shotcrete process. Um, but it, you know, it's not until you get the crew on site who's gonna do it, you have the light and the space where you're doing it, and you have the actual material that you're gonna use that you can really start to see it. And so built into the construction process and sequence were some uh, of that testing. We were joined by um, the leadership of the museum to look at stuff and uh, we did that on site. And not just with not just with the shot crate, with the floors and the walls and all, there's constant kind of testing and mock-ups going on as the construction sequence progressed, which is fairly typical for a construction project of this magnitude, but I would say we were extra thorough uh, with this job. Cool, thanks. So, hi, I'm Catherine. I'm an architecture student here at the Cooper Union. And I was wondering if you could speak to the challenge of precision through the process of spraying shotcrete for this freeform structure. That's a great question. Um, so the short answer is, in many areas of it, it's not precise because it doesn't need to be. So we really don't, uh, and this is like probably the number one thing that will drive costs. Well, the number two thing. Number one thing is schedule in New York. You got to get it done quickly. Uh, but the number two thing when you're working with um, a really, a, a geometry with no repetition and no kind of, um, you know, it's like um, organic, let's say. Um, you, if you're holding the contractors to a fraction of an inch at every point on that service, you would quadruple the cost, or I'm making that up. You couldn't afford it. Um, so you wouldn't actually want to use shotcrete in that, in that case. So we really only, uh, we were um, well above conventional concrete tolerance, which, it, which refers to the amount of dimension that you could be in or out or up or down from a set point in the drawing or in the model. So we way relaxed the tolerance, and this is something that we've done in other, <clears throat> other projects using um, fluid, the fluid aspect of concrete to get amorphous geometries. You can relax the, um, the tolerance everywhere except places like stairs or where you're interfacing with another system like the facade system, the skylights, um, certain technical components like lighting or infrastructural things that need to be located for reasons of their technical performance or for code. So it's all about finding the moments and documenting super clearly in the model, this has to be right here and everything emanates out from those points. And at certain points up in, this, up in the sky up in there, we could be, uh, we could be off the drawings by uh, many inches and, and we accept that. Hi, we have time I'm for one more question. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Sarah, and I know at the beginning you went through the original plans for the museum and the original flow and how that flow kind of got messed up over the years of the construction of the new of new buildings, but this building in particular was supposed to bring a lot of that flow back to the museum. And I was wondering if you found or for any particular way you design the connections to kind of change the experience of um, the users of the museum, like how that, how this new building's not only changed um, the experience of this particular wing, but the rest of the museum itself. Do you wanna to speak to the experience of moving <laughs> between? Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a great question. And what I wanna share is that, you know, we're just in the process of doing qualitative and visitor studies to not only share, you know, sort of reflect on our own experience, but really watch carefully how people are moving through the space. So um, it, it turns out that um, the pandemic did one thing that we didn't quite plan, which is that many of those connections now are really white spaces. They really are opportunities to, for visitors to sort of relax their eyes 
and move between Jeannie and, and Wes's building, Studio Gang's building, and the rest of the museum. So you, so you imagine now that there are sort of these transitional zones that are, that are not concealed to be something else. And I, for one, feel that that was the right choice for us. It wasn't necessarily fully intentional. Um, at least I don't believe that it was intentional that those walls would not have exhibits on them. But because of the pandemic, when we were built, it was not a major focus for us. So only to say that I think that given the amount of visitors we have now, having those transition zones, some of them are maybe 30 feet long, mm -hmm. some of them are more rectilinear, and you could imagine that maybe we would add seating in some of those spaces between, you know, when you're heading east and west. The other thing that, that we haven't talked a lot about, which is maybe appropriate, is just the content. Um, so um, through the south node, your the building created adjacencies with very important cultural halls. And so we had to really reimagine those cultural halls as having two entrances. And how do we introduce visitors to cultural halls that were also historic became is a challenge. And we have started that work, but we're not nearly done. So there's both a visual as well as a content connection understanding. Some of those connections are well understood and would likely persist, especially the ones between the Gilder building and the Rose Center on the north. I would say the ones that perhaps are between the Gilder Center and some of the cultural halls, we still have some work to do, I think, both visually in terms of architecture, but also in terms of content. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful questions, and thank you for coming.